Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Romoliotis, aka PD Beats. Hello and welcome to the Pop Turnative Podcast, the podcast where we have digital discussions, the worlds of sports, pop culture. Social media, everything really, depending on the guests, we talk about it all. As always, I'm your host, Peter Miliotis. On Twitter, you know me as PD Beats. And my guest is a four-time Olympic gold medalist. She is a member of the Hockey Hall of Fame, and she is currently the, um, the assistant director of player development with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Haley Wickenheiser is back on Pop Alternative. Haley, welcome to Pop Alternative. Thanks for having me. Three times. I mean, I, I mean, I have to get you something now, like a mug or a jacket or something. You've been on the show three <laughs> times. Yeah, yeah, maybe a, a nice uh, snapback hat there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll order those and we'll get we'll, we'll send those to Calgary. But uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're really busy, and it's it's you know almost wearing two hats right now. Still the hockey stuff, but also you know doing med school as well in Calgary. I mean, you're just it's just been pretty busy. But it's something that you've been doing for a while, kind of wearing these two hats: the med school hat and the hockey hat. You've been doing that for a while, right? A, a while, right? Yeah, I'm in my, um, I guess I'm in my second year with both, actually. I started, I started medicine, and, uh, and then I got a call uh, from Kyle Dubas and the Leafs um, with regards to this role. So um, it's been a juggling, juggling match, I guess, uh, w- with both, but I, I tend to, to make it work. I fly back and forth uh, anywhere from four to six times a month, and um, I can get a lot of lectures podcasted on my uh, flights to Toronto. Four hours, you can do a lot of work there. So <laughs> I've uh, become pretty efficient. And uh, yeah. actually, one gives me energy for the other. So I, I enjoy doing both. In terms of the player development stuff with the Toronto Maple Leafs, is there an aspect of that job that you enjoy that you, um, you know, getting into it, you weren't sure maybe what to expect, but is there some aspect? Is it the communications with the coaching staff? Is it kind of watching the hockey and seeing these players develop? What do you like about it, Haley? Uh, the thing I like the most is the collaborative environment and the chance to get on the ice with players and make a direct, you know, direct impact when you're out on the ice. We do development days where we, um, you know, whether we're mostly with the, the Marlies um, on, on a big scale where we divide up into pods and we work on certain skills. I get a chance to work on skills with players, which I like, or uh, return to play with injured players, um, uh, whether it's Leafs or, or Marlies and getting out there and you get a chance to really impact players. I feel like um, I'm still very close to being a player, so I understand what it what it's like on the daily, not only the physical side of it, but the mental grind. And and that's uh, that's the part I enjoy the most is trying to, to figure out how to help players get better. So it's it's you kind of like I'm, I'm pretty, it's perfect segue because it's something I definitely wanted to ask you in the interview and I'm going to ask it now because what you just answered about the the job with the Leafs kind of reminds me. So I was having these conversations about all these players in the National Hockey League and the question of like what does it take to make it to the NHL is something that's always kind of like brought up, you know what I mean? But it seems like the NHL, yes, it's a speed, it's a speed game, it's a skill game, but it's also a game where players have to adapt to certain roles that they might be playing a junior that they're not maybe comfortable in professional hockey. Like they're used to being, you know, the first line um, scorer in junior, but you know, they come to a new environment, a new hockey team where they don't need to be that person. They have to be the third line or fourth line player. They have to adapt to that. And that might not be very comfortable for them. So do you know what I mean? Is that something you see as well? It's becoming an adaptable game as well. Yeah, I mean, unless you're a superstar, uh, by the time you hit the NHL, your role is going to change. There's no question. Uh, And depending on the team, the coach, the whole nine yards. So I think the biggest thing that I see in players um, is the great players have, uh, an attention to detail that's really second to none. They know exactly what they want to do. They have a purpose with why they come to the rink. They're um, obsessively meticulous about getting better in every aspect of their game, not even, not all, just on the ice, but off the ice. And then um, we'll say sort of the average NHL player. I mean, to make it to the NHL is a, is a huge accomplishment, but not all NHL players are created equal, I think. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of a group of players who... You know, guys that are just happy to be there and they were good enough to get there and they don't necessarily have that next level desire or drive to want to hone their craft every single day. 
And so that's really what separates, I think, when you get to that NHL level is that, that 1%, because physically guys are very similar. Um, but it's, you know, who can keep your head on and, and then who can be consistent and perform under those moments of pressure that matter. And you, me- you mentioned, you know, good enough to get there. Is it still kind of the all-around package, the speed, the skill, the hockey IQ? Or are you seeing one of those elements kind of playing more of a, a bigger role these days? I think how I would describe it is that the NHL players tend to have mostly all of those things. And every level you go below that, they're missing something. So if they're playing the American League, maybe they don't have the, the, the brains to play at the NHL level, but they have the speed and the shot and everything else. And the lower you go, the more that those things are tend to be missing. Um, and so at the NHL level, I think, you know, players are generally, everyone's pretty fast these days. Everyone can shoot the puck. Um, but I think what separates guys is some guys are, you know, exceptionally fast. So the speed, they have to rely on their speed to make an impact. Other guys are cerebral and they're playmakers. So whatever your strength is, you really have to use that to separate at the next level. But they're all... Um, generally good at all of those skills it's it's crazy to see the hockey development um and yeah we'll get we'll get to Wickfest soon because it's on your shirt but i was gonna bring it up i, I don't know i was I'm, of course i was gonna bring it up but it's just it's crazy we talked about it last time you were on too is like when we we're talking about like the world juniors and just seeing like all the other countries now like developing players like canada like it's it's insane it's it's becoming like a horse race with like five or six nations it's nuts yeah you know i was at um the Calgary Hitman game last night, watching Saskatoon play Calgary and a prospect that we have. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch the evolution of hockey in this country. And um, sometimes I feel like when I watch junior hockey, I'm watching like hockey robots. I, I'm not seeing a lot of creativity. I'm not seeing a lot of um, go slow to go fast type hockey play. Not a lot of plays being made. It's just a lot of forward, forward stuff. And um, I think what other countries in the world are, are gaining on us is um, they're starting to play a little bit more of that, that style of a five-man game and moving the puck and then playing with speed. And I, I just, um, you know, it's amazing if you look at a country like Finland with how few players they have. They actually produce like five, I think they have 5,000 female players and I don't know, maybe 12,000 male players. Not very many compared to Canada. We've got almost a million players. So for what they're producing and what they're doing, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, and a lot of those European countries rely on developing athletes first and hockey players second. And I think in Canada, we can always look to what those countries are doing sometimes and learn from that. And I think that's why the World Juniors and even like the U18 and the Gretzky Halinka, I think those tournaments are getting a lot more exposure because one, social media, that's the obvious one. But I think it's, it's what it's, it's setting the tone and it's, it's telling people that there's other countries now that are really, really, you know, developing these players. And it's, yeah. it's just really, really cool to see. Yeah, it's great to see. I mean, for us to think that we've, we're so far ahead of the rest of the world in development of hockey is so wrong. I don't think that necessarily we do, but I think we have to, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, if you're really looking at hockey worldwide, um, you have to understand that the rest of the world is coming hard and fast and we're not that different. Absolutely. So a project and an event that you're very passionate about is Wickfest. And we talk about Wickfest every time you come on the show. And um, I understand that Wickfest is expanding. It's getting bigger. Yeah, we've grown. Um, you know, we started it in uh, Burnaby after the 2010 Olympics for four years. We moved it to Calgary and now we're in our 10th year. We're back to Surrey. Um, we looked at Halifax this year, likely for next year, as well as uh, Toronto and the GTA. And uh, we've had chats with Tampa and places like Nashville. So it's uh, it's exciting to, to be able to grow. We've worked with 30,000 female players over 10 years. Um, so that's a lot of kids that have come through the doors of WickFest. And uh, yeah, it's my passion project. I'm pretty proud of it. We've got a great team that, that organizes it. Um, and it's not just a hockey tournament. We, we expose them to everything off the ice as well and bring in lots of Olympic athletes and NHL players to work with the kids. That's amazing. There's something about event planning and event organizing because I, I did it myself when I was younger too with concert promotions and, you know, working with Hockey Canada at the World Juniors. When you see these events and you work these events and it's like so much work and st- sometimes things like go wrong. But when the event happens and you see it and it's, it, it's, it's, it's like the doors are open, everything's good, that feeling, it's a great feeling. And I'm sure you felt that with Wickfest as well. 
Yeah, you know, I've got a great team that does all the work. I think they say event planning is like one of the most um, stressful things a human can go through. Yeah. Like I, yeah, it's like top three most stressful things that you can experience. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's a ton of work. We got, you know, we have 7,000 people that come through our doors over each weekend and just managing logistics, waivers, insurance. Like if you think of all the little details that go into making hockey run in this country, it's amazing that we survive, but it's like a volunteer spirit that, that does it. And people um, just come and for no reason, they come show up, they volunteer for us, they chip in, they, they get a cool hoodie and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, no, but it's, it's <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to like sum it up like that. I come to Wickfest to get a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, it was, you know, you mentioned um, a little bit about, you know, your about going to to med school in Calgary. Um, but I was wondering if you can kind of share more in terms of your decision to go into that field when you were once you were done with hockey, Haley. Yeah, I guess um, I always have loved medicine since I was a kid. So anyone that has known me long enough knows that I had this Harvard. Um, med school sweatshirt that I got given to me when I was like eight or nine years old. And I wore that thing until it was like ragged because <laughs> I had this, this thought that I would go to Harvard med school. I, I probably could have. I had an opportunity to go play hockey at Harvard and I likely could have continued on into medicine, but I, just, I wanted to stay in Canada. I really believe that staying in Canada was the best thing for me. So anyway, that dream died very early, but um, I've always wanted to do it. And I actually thought when I finished with the national team that my time in hockey would be over and I would just move on to a completely different life. I didn't really uh, foresee anything happening. And then um, this call came from the Leafs. And so I was really happy to be able to stay in the game at, at that level. But I, I get, I, I do, I love emergency medicine. So everything I do in the emerge, I can take onto the ice when I'm in hockey and somebody gets cut or <laughs> someone goes into cardiac arrest in the rink like you know those are skills that I actually know what to do mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty cool and I think it's just um, medicine I like because uh, for so many years I was an athlete you're very selfish you're very into yourself and what you do and what you think and eat and sleep and I get a chance to like get out of that and take care of other people um, and I really enjoy that How's the balance been? Was it uh, like what you expected it was going to be or it, how, like, how's, how's that been overall? Yeah, it, you know, I talked to quite a few people that have been through Calgary's program is three years, not four, and it goes 11 months. Um, and a lot of it is you can podcast a lot of it. So my friends that have gone through it have said, you know, the first two years you'll be fine in terms of being able to manage both hockey. And then hopefully I'll be able to do uh, some of my resident clerkship and residency um, in Toronto when I'm working with the Leafs as well. Um, so it's, it's a lot of work. I work long days. There's no doubt about it. There's no real days off for me, but, um, I'm not afraid of hard work. I've done it my whole life. So it's, uh, it's been fine. It's actually been fine. Less stressful than I thought. I'm I, well, I, I'm caught in the loop with, with everything, you know, with my father being a pediatrician. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, I'm studying, I'm studying pediatric right now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> child well, medicine that's way that's just complicated <laughs> <laughs> no it, it, it's crazy um getting back to hockey i mean i don't want to sugarcoat it i say this to you all the time women's hockey is one of the best products out there the skill the speed it's it's incredible it's amazing but we have seen a struggle to get the product out there and to get yeah. the exposure out there might yeah. be hard for you to answer but what steps need to be done to allow this amazing product to be seen to the masses? No, it is a great question. Um, well, the first, so it's like a chicken and egg. If you don't have the television and the exposure, how can people watch the game? And then you can't grow the game, right? So what comes first? So I think it's a couple of things. I think right now, if women's pro hockey is about to happen, it's the NHL that's going to do it. It is not any of these leagues that exist or don't exist anymore. Those leagues you know, essentially need to go away. <laughs> and we need one league with four to six um, teams. That's it, probably based in Eastern Canada, Eastern US because of travel, logistics and cost. And you get the best players in the world, not just in Canada or the US, in the world in these, in these teams. Um, kind of like the original six in the NHL. And then we need broadcast television rights, which will likely have to come from both Canada and the US to showcase these games in a 40 to 60 game season. And 
I don't think you play in 20,000 seat arenas. You maybe play in the junior arenas. Um, you, you make it a, an event. It's not just a hockey game. When people come to the rink, they are coming for an event. Um, and you're able to showcase that product. And so it really takes champions. I think the NHL does have a plan for women's pro hockey and time will tell if we'll see that. Um, I think broadcasters have to be braver and bolder and take a stance on this and, um, you know, sort of put their neck out uh, in terms of covering more women's sports. Like every time I turn on the TV and I see darts or bowling, I'm just going to lose my mind because women's hockey is far more entertaining than those, you know. So those are the types of things that I think need to happen. It frustrates me, though. It really does. Because I've since I was a kid, you know, I grew up, you know, watching yourself and Jada Heffern at the Olympics and like just being kind of glued to it and saying this is amazing and I always loved it and it's just this push and pull and this struggle with the leagues and getting it out there it's just it's become frustrating to the fans it is I don't blame the fans to be frustrated I mean I've been frustrated for probably 15 years (laughs) playing fighting fighting for this I mean the best thing that's happened is the players and I have been saying saying this for five six years like the players we needed to to stop playing, to lock out essentially, and just say that mm-hmm. enough's enough. We're not playing in either league mm-hmm. because either league isn't the answer. So that is a great first step. They're going to force the hand um, of whoever is going to have to make decisions to push this thing forward. But it is frustrating, um, and you have to be brave. You have to be willing to stand up for what you believe in. And I guess it's no different than what uh, Billie Jean King did with the W two eight in yeah. tennis and. And uh, I guess she's helping with this this new uh, movement too. So uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure it'll happen at some point. No, absolutely. Well, Haley, we'll wrap up. But thank you for coming on Pop Turner for a third time. I gotta yeah, go. No I gotta go. Or, I gotta go order those snapbacks now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. Snapbacks. There you go. And I'll uh, I'll get back to my uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Toronto <laughs> your, note. Your med school. <laughs> But uh, no, seriously, all the best with uh, Wickfest. And again, congratulations for being inducted to the Hockey Hall of Fame. That is fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Appreciate it. Always no good problem. Well, this has been Pop Turner, YouTube.com slash Pop Turner for previous episodes. And until next time, this is Haley Wickenheiser and Peter Beats signing off. Thank you for tuning in to Pop Turnative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Pop Turnative on YouTube. Be sure to like Pop Turnative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been an Autograph Communications production.